Okay, uh, welcome to the module four, Gene Fusions. I uh, hope everyone had a great lunch. Um, so in this module, we're going to learn about uh, the impact of gene fusions and cancer. We're going to learn about uh, the different types of evidence for gene fusions. We're going to focus mainly on RNA-seq. And we're going to uh, learn about a little bit about how the available detection methods work and what the types of false positives that they produce. Uh, and uh, also try and be able to assess a, a gene fusion's potential function. So first we'll define a gene fusion as just a novel gene uh, formed by fusion of two uh, distinct wild type genes. And in cancer, of course, these are produced by uh, genomic rearrangements. The, the canonical example, of course, is the BCR-ABL uh, fusion that defines uh, chronic myeloid, um, myelogenous leukemia. Uh, this is an interesting rearrangement because it, it was basically the first uh, somatic change that was uh, linked to, to cancer, identified uh, some 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, and it's, it's also one of the success stories because we have drugs that target it. So we know that uh, gene fusions are relevant in cl clinical features in cancer. They're prognostic markers, so here are BCR, ABL1 is our, our uh, canonical example of this. Uh, they're, they're targetable. We have a drug, Aminitib, that targets bcr able one And uh, we also have a lot of excitement um, recently in discovering new gene fusions. This is spurned um, by a few things. There was a discovery about five or six years ago of TMPRS's two ERG fusions in prostate cancer. Fusions were, before then, uh, thought to only drive uh, leukemias and sarcomas and other more rare cancers, but then they were discovered in solid tumors. There was a hope that uh, the more common solid tumors, for those we could also find gene fusions that could be targeted the same as we could target BCR-ABL1. Um, at the same time as discovering PMPRSS2 ERG, all of these new available uh, platforms became available uh, for discovering of no novel sequences, including gene fusions, and those include RNA-seq and genome sequencing. So we know there uh, in, in some cancers, gene fusions are initiators of carcinogenesis because they correlate with cancer phenotype. Uh, if you successfully treat some of these cancers, then it eradicates the, the fusion products. They're no longer detectable in the bloodstream. Uh, we see in, in uh, mouse models that gene fusions uh, produce neoplastic disorders, and also in, in cell lines, if we silence the gene fusions, then we uh, reverse tumor genesis in some instances. We can think of a couple classes of gene fusions. One is uh, proto up regulation of proto-oncogenes. So these are genes that are normally very tightly regulated in their, uh, in their transcription. And if we translocate, say, for instance, uh, MYC to a, a uh, different loci that has uh, juxtaposes it with a new promoter that results in overexpression of MYC, then that can result in uh, tumor genesis, and that's exactly what happens in Burkitt's lymphoma. And then, of course, the other type of fusion we can get is a chimeric gene where uh, a novel fusion gene is created that co-ops the domains of two uh, wild-type genes. So it's, it's taking the functionality from two different genes and creating a new gene. If we look at the partners that are commonly forming, the, the genes that are commonly forming, forming gene fusions as their partners, uh, we see a, a few different classes. Tyrosine kinases are quite common. Uh, transcription factors are another common class of, of gene fusion partners. And then generally oncogenes that, uh, again, are normally tightly regulated, but then because of a gene fusion, they become upregulated. Those uh, are another class of gene fusion partners. If we sort of map out the connections between uh, genes. Here we're creating a network of, of genes connected by um, edges if, uh, if those two genes are formed a, a gene fusion. Then they form a, a scale-free network and that basically is telling us that uh, there's a few genes that are very promiscuous so they form uh, gene fusions with a very large number of partners and then there's uh, the majority of genes just have one or two partners. 
In terms of the genomic effects of gene, oh, yeah. So when a gene form forms a partner, is there any specific sequence which is causing a, having partner preference or it's just random? Um, is there a, yeah, the question is, is there a specific sequence that is associated with these, these fusions, uh, maybe at the break point? Um, I don't think that's, that's the case. Uh, if you look at the, the, so if you look at the breakpoints themselves, there might be a signature of the, um, of the mechanism by which the actual genomic DNA was broken and then rejoined. So there could be a sequence signature there, but then in the fusion itself, that's usually the genomic breakpoint is spliced out. So then what you end up with at the fusion uh, boundary is just the sequences of each gene. Like A gene forms a, a fusion event with B, but A is not forming with B, so there's no preference for A to form a fusion. Yeah. So is there any sequence similarity between the genes? I see what you mean. So I think the, the preference that we're, we're seeing in terms of how these networks come about, the gene fusion network, is, is basically because of function of the genes, not necessarily sequence. So at, at the sequence level, um, that's there's you know, there's no similarity. It's just because at a higher level, there's it's bringing together these uh, groups of um, exons that have some specific function. So. Okay, so we can leverage uh, these three different signals: chimeric DNA sequence, RNA sequence, and expression change to uh, identify gene fusions. And uh, so the first, the, for the first one, expression arrays. Uh, this is actually how the TMPRSS s 2 erg fusions were, were discovered uh, five or six years ago. I think uh, RNA-seq was just coming about, but uh, they used, in this case, they used uh, expression arrays with um, something called COPA, which has actually never been used since this discovery, uh, because RNA-seq kind of uh, preempted it, or not preempted it, but uh, came on the scene and people started using that. Anyway, so... Uh, they, they basically looked for outlier expression and used that to identify a candidate uh, set of genes and then they, they uh, further restricted their analysis to one particular set of genes. Uh, so that was based purely on expression. Of course, we can also do genome sequencing uh, and this has led to the discovery of, of some fusions uh, in colorectal adenocarcinomas, but uh, most of the uh, fusions discovered have not been with genome sequencing. I think uh, because it's it's a little bit more expensive. Um, we don't get expression information, so we we can find translocations, but we don't know if if that's actually resulting in a fusion product that's uh, a fusion transcript that's being expressed and then turned into a protein. And then mRNA seq, I think, is the the standard of choice for discovering fusions currently. Uh, that's the benefits here are that it's relatively inexpensive compared to whole genome. It uh, gives us information about the expression, so we, we can find the chimeric fusion transcript, and we can also see if that fusion transcript is uh, highly expressed and therefore maybe relevant to the biology of the cancer. Okay, so going into how um, some specifics of RNA-seq, this is going to be a little bit similar to what Jared's talking about, but uh, I'll, so I'll go over it quickly and then you guys can answer, ask questions. So the difference with uh, RNA-seq compared to whole genome sequencing, say, is just in, in how we select uh, the molecules that we're going to put on the sequencing machine. And so for RNA-seq, we're isolating mRNA by doing a poly-A pull-down and then doing reverse transcription. So one of the important things here is reverse transcription during that process, we take single-stranded mRNA and we turn it into double-stranded cDNA, but we don't know, uh, for the, the subsequent cDNA molecules, we don't know which of those uh, two strands came from the original mRNA, so we lose strand information in most cases. There's, there's libraries that get around this, uh, but I don't think they're quite as common as uh, the regular mRNA-seq libraries for which you lose the strand information. So now we have uh, a collection of reads that we've sequenced, and some of them may come from fusion transcripts, 
and we can classify with the types of reads that would come from Fusion Transcript. Uh, we get wild type reads, which basically are just uh, appear as if they come from one gene or the other. And we get what we call spanning reads, where one, or dis I think Jared called them discordant reads, where one read maps entirely to one gene and one to another gene, and then we get split reads, where the actual read itself is uh, split by the, the fusion boundary. And all three of these are, are uh, evidence for gene fusions. I guess wild type reads are evidence for gene fusions just in terms of the expression information that they, they yield. Is spanning and split reads? Yep. Because they look Spanning read will span the gene fusion boundary. Yeah. And then split read. So for a split read, uh, we're the fusion boundary is is occurring within the read sequence itself, not within the unsequenced portion of the read in the middle. That's the distinction. But the spanning read also has the both colors, right? Orange and green. Yeah. So both of them are, are discordant, you could say, in that they can't be mapped to one contiguous location in the, in the genome. But uh, there's, a, there's a small difference in that for, uh, for the spanning reads, if we independently map each end, we can get a, a full contiguous alignment of the, each end to, to, the, uh, to the original transcripts. But for the split read, it's a little bit more difficult to map those split reads because uh, there's a fusion boundary in the middle. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about assembly, uh, but it's not as, as used for fusion discovery. But nevertheless, uh, we're going to talk mainly about alignment. Um, I can, I guess, I can contrast assembly and alignment by saying that uh, there's two processes or two things, two parts to the the process where you predict uh, fusions or, in general, uh, aberrant sequences. And the first is to cluster reads uh, that support the same, the same change or mutation. And the second is to, uh, so the, the first is to cluster reads, and the second is to align uh, sequences to the reference and compare those, uh, those sequences. And so it, we're kind of reversing these between alignment and assembly. In, in assembly, we're, we're first grouping the reads together into context by looking at reads that overlap, and then we're aligning to the reference genome to find out where those contexts are different and then nominate uh, changes like gene fusions. Uh, with alignment, we're doing independently doing the mapping that, uh, first to find these alignments that support uh, a mutation. Uh, or a translocation if the reads are discordantly mapped, and then we're uh, clustering those after the fact. Um, so I'll mainly talk about alignment uh, because that the majority of the tools are are alignment based. Okay, so with alignment, uh, we have this problem of having these uh, discordant reads that we have to map to map back to the genome or assign uh, back to genomic loci. And if we can do that, then we can nominate these fusion transcripts. Um, the problem here is that uh, some of the, our reads are going to be split by introns. So if you, you can see on the, uh, do we have a laser pointer? If your, your mouse is probably on its other screen. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, so this read on the right uh, is split by this intron in gene Y. Uh, so this is this is going to make uh, mapping difficult. And on the left here, this uh, this read is split by this fusion boundary. So uh, in order to fully assign this read to the genomic loci that it originated from, we'd have to take all of these different segments and line, uh, find those locations in the genome. Of course, we can uh, we can. Um, make the problem a little bit easier by assigning these uh, reads to gene sequences themselves. But if we assume that we know all of the gene models and we, hence we know all of these um, wild type transcripts, then we don't have to deal with the fact that this read on the right here is, is split by the, uh, this intron in gene Y. And so that kind of alludes to the fact that the choice of reference is important for RNA-seq and this uh, uh, this is not in the. Um, this is on the 
on the wiki in a slightly updated version of the slides, and I apologize for changing the slides, but um, this basically shows that uh, these guys were comparing ensemble, ref gene, and UCSC, and, and generally uh, comparing using both the transcriptome and the genome as a reference, and uh, using the transcriptome only or the genome only, and what they show is that uh, using both the transcriptome and the genome as the reference to which we align means that we get about 95% uh, of the reads to have uh, um, an, a mapping to either the transcriptome or the genome, compared with if uh, we do not map to any of the gene models, just, just to the genome, we get 90% uh, of the reads mapping. Um, and so combining those two references is going to give us more power. And that's what most of these tools do. Yeah? If, if we lose the strandedness of the transcript, and yeah. we actually put it to DNA, how yeah. do we know whether the gene is on the positive or the negative strand? Like, if, it, if that transcript corresponds to a gene on the positive yeah. strand? Or the that's, that's a really good question. I think you have to use, um, it, you have to sort of infer it from additional information. And so I think one of the strongest um, signals that you can get that will, is that if the, say you predict a fusion contig and then you align it back to the genome, if when you align it back to the genome, the, the splicing looks like the splicing of an existing gene, then that's a, a good sign that it's following this, it's on the same strand as that existing gene. So I, I think we'll have an example of that in the lab. Kind of on the topic of splicing, does yep. mapping to the known gene um, take into account in in these um, yeah so yeah it, so for instance in this study they're mapping back to all of the the splice variants that are in, in these particular databases and so um, if the intron that you that you read is aligns across is in that database then it should map uh, reasonably well but of course novel splicing uh, then that's going to be the same. Pretty much, it's the same problem as finding a, um, a fusion read, except it's restricted to a you know a region the size of a gene. Yeah. Okay. So when we are thinking about um, this problem, I guess we can think about the alignment problem as being quite easy if we are just looking for exact matches. It gets a little bit harder when we are looking for um, alignments with some indels and mismatches. Uh, and then if we're looking for non-contiguous alignments, and maybe we're also accounting for indels and mismatches, this is uh, perhaps the hardest alignment problem we can think of. Uh, generally, what we do is we leverage the fact that we know something about how to solve the easy problem to solve the hard problem. Uh, so for instance, uh, one of the strategies that is quite widely used is to just segment the reads. So, it, given this original read sequence, we chop it up into three pieces, and then hopefully uh, individual pieces from this read align reasonably well to the, to the reference genome, and we can leverage existing tools to align those segments back to the genome. We can also do something where we try and, instead of modifying the reads, we modify the reference. So if a priori we know that uh, there's a translocation between two genes, then we can uh, try and align our reads to a merged reference, basically, that is just those two gene sequences. Um, and a combination of these approaches, I think, is what's most common, which takes information that we uh, get from paired end reads. So if, if we can independently map this uh, green end to gene X and this orange end to gene Y, then we know perhaps that there's a gene fusion involving gene X and gene Y. We don't know exactly where the fusion boundary is, but then we can use this previous approach where we, uh, in some way, uh, create a, a pseudo-reference out of gene X and gene Y, and then do a more sensitive alignment to get um, a split read that uh, tells us what the exact fusion boundary is between gene X and gene Y. And this, the, I guess this slide is more for reference as to what the available tools use. So uh, in the first column, uh, most of them produce an exact sequence. There's quite a few of these uh, fusion discovery tools, as you can see. And I think this is probably not all of them, even 
uh, one of the ones, Star Fusion, that we we're using in the lab is not even on here. So, um, seg this uh, second column is mostly methodological and whether or not the, the reads are segmented before they're mapped back to the genome. Uh, the third column, whether or not they leverage paired end information. Um, whether or not they use an approximate reference scheme, as we are showing here, is uh, this fourth column. Uh, another alternative is uh, to this idea is where we take, say we nominate uh, gene X and gene Y as being fused, we can just concatenate um, all of the pairs of exons between gene X and gene Y and look for reads that map exactly to those uh, exon boundaries. And so that's this column, and then whether or not they search for an exact fusion boundary uh, and account for the possibility that there could be mismatches in the reads that map to the, the fusion boundary is on the, the far right. There are a few assembly-based tools, um, and I think Transibus and Trinity have been used to find fusions in, in uh, various studies, and then there's obviously there's two steps to the assembly method. You assemble some contigs, and then you have to basically sift through those contexts and try and identify the ones that are fusions, and this has been done using uh, GMAP or Dissect or Barnacle, those three methods. So based on uh, this one study that independently evaluates a number of these tools, you can see that um, the most sensitive tools also produce a lot of results. So the most, two most sensitive are Top Hat Fusion and Camara Scan. Uh, each of those in this study, well, Chimera Scan produces 13,000 uh, fusion predictions, and Top Hat Fusion produces 136,000. So, uh, the, it's there, there's still a little bit of work to be done in terms of producing a reasonable number of fusions with the utmost accuracy. So, my own tool, Diffuse, uh, is reasonably sensitive, but um, thankfully only produces 900 fusion predictions, which is still quite a lot to, um, to parse in one sample. Um, and then, of course, uh, they showed it also in the same paper that you can't really rely on simulated uh, data entirely for, for understanding the sensitivity of these methods. The data is just, the real data is too complex. Sources of false positives. Okay, so we have um, alignment artifacts are a huge source of fa false positives and uh, chimeric reads that come from the uh, the molecular biology, so we can get template switching when we're doing the reverse transcriptase, um, and we can also get ligation, ligation artifacts. These are usually random, and so they uh, they don't produce a large number of reads, and so just filtering predictions that have fewer reads gets rid of those. Uh, and then, of course, we have natural sources of rearrangement, such as um, immunoglobulin re rearrangements. If you your sample contains a lot of uh, immune infiltration, that'll be a problem. And uh, other transposons, nuclear mito mitochondrial uh, insertions, etc. Okay, so uh, solutions for alignment artifacts that we found is to calculate features uh, of the supporting alignments and then either use heuristic filters or uh, machine learning uh, techniques, and uh, that's what we used in, in Diffuse, my own tool, um, although the, those techniques have been applied for pretty much all of the fusion discovery tools. And so I'll go through a few of the uh, features that are this most distinguish false positives uh, from, from true fusions. The first one here, so what we're showing is a histogram, uh, green is the positive examples and red is the negative examples. And we're just showing that this, there's some separation between positive and negative for each of these features. And the first feature is uh, how well the, the reads distribute across the fusion boundary. We expect uh, if they're uh, aligned, or, um, we expect in a true fusion that they should be well distributed across the fusion boundary because there's no reason that a particular location should capture all of these reads unless they're PCR duplicates or an artifact. Um, uh, the second, uh, second feature that we can calculate is whether or not uh, the fusion boundary uh, 
coincides with an axon boundary with a known, a known splice signal. So what happens usually is you get a translocation in the middle of uh, two introns. So it brings together two intron sequences. And then in the fusion transcript, that intron is spliced out. And so what you end up in RNA-seq is uh, an exon boundary fused to another exon boundary. And so then if you look in the genome at the, the boundary, the fusion boundary, you should see uh, the splice signal on one side and the matching splice signal on the other, so GT to AG, which is the most common. Um, so the same with, uh, with genome rearrangements that we saw in the previous lecture and, and lab. Uh, if you have too, too many uh, possible alignments of all of your supporting reads, then it's a good sign that you've, uh, you have an artifact, either that or you can't reasonably tell which of the possible mapping locations is going to be your actual gene fusion. And usually these don't validate. Uh, another thing people do, and this is done in, in both assembly methods and uh, and in mapping-based methods, is look at, given the, the assembled fusion sequence, how well do the uh, do the reads align to that assembled uh, fusion contig, and how well do they how well do they align? That can include uh, whether or not the paired end reads align and have a a length between them that is what we expect given the fragment length distribution. Uh, this is uh, pretty much the same as uh, one of the other slides where we are looking at how well the spanning reads span across the, the fusion, or are distributed across the fusion boundary. Uh, and finally, whoops, another strong signal of a, of a false positive is where we don't have a, where we can't uh, exactly assign part of the fusion contig sequence to one gene and a distinct part to the other gene. If we have a significant amount of overlap, say if 75% of it maps to one gene and uh, an overlapping uh, section, and the other 25% uh, plus 50% that is overlapping maps to the other gene, then uh, this is a good sign of a, a false positive. And I'll show you an example of this in the lecture, or sorry, in the lab. OK, so we have also natural sources of rearrangement. Uh, a good way to get rid of these is by through database searches. Uh, and we also have transcription-induced chimeras or read-throughs. And this is what, happen, what happens to produce these is uh, a gene is uh, not rearranged, but it, when it's being transcribed, a uh, transcription stop site is skipped. And then it reads through into the next gene, and so then, that, then those two uh, genes are co-transcribed, and it looks as if it's a gene fusion between adjacent genes. And these are very common, even in benign samples. Yep? Are those uh, transcription-induced chimeras usually filtered out by most of these programs? Yeah, I think a lot of them, um, some of them you have an option to filter them, and some of them they're flagged. Uh, yeah, I think all of the people who have designed these tools are, are cognizant of them, so because they're very common. They they dominate like the bulk of the predictions. Um, okay, so when we want to prioritize uh, real gene fusions, we can look at a uh, number of things of so expression, see if the, the fusion is uh, is highly expressed, particularly if the three prime gene is, is highly expressed, as that's often the one that has the function. Uh, in the fusion gene. Uh, we can look at recurrence, whether or not it's, it's seen across multiple samples. We can look for a corroborating rearrangement if we have any information about the, the genome. We can look at the function, uh, particularly of the, the three prime gene. Is it a kinase? Um, and could it serve as a drug target? We could look at whether or not the, the function is preserved by the fusion. So whether or not the breakpoint occurs within an intron, and also whether or not it pre preserves the reading frame of both genes. And that's uh, a little bit complicated, and I'll go into that in the next one of the next slides. Um, 
So looking at expression, we can also look at uh, not only whether or not the 3' gene is highly expressed, but also whether or not the expression is interrupted. And that tells us basically that if, if we see a, a large uh, discontinuity in the expression across one of the genes that's for which we predicted a fusion, so here for instance, in H and F1A, we see that um, expression starts uh, right at the, the breakpoint that we've predicted uh, from the mRNA seq. And so uh, before this breakpoint, there's pretty much no expression of these uh, five prime exons, probably because uh, only the fusion version of H and F1A is being expressed, and the fusion ver version only has this uh, last three prime exons after the breakpoint. So we can look at things that are, are recurrent. Um, here's a good example where they looked across multiple different tumor types, prostate, thyroid, uh, etc., and they found that there were there these fusions were recurrent in that a single uh, partner, BRAF, was always uh, fused to another uh, five prime gene, and they would have actually missed this if they hadn't looked across multiple uh, cancer types. Um, so this slide, I'm just looking at uh, two different data sets that show that read-throughs are, are quite common in, uh, in benign samples on the right. So in, on the right we have uh, a lot of, or maybe 20 fusions that we've predicted in LNCAP. And then we've looked across uh, some benign and other tumor samples, and we see that the ones that are shown in blue, with this blue annotation here, are all uh, recurrent. The only one that is between adjacent genes and is not recurrent is this one that is also associated with a deletion between those two genes. So generally these read-throughs are, are recurrent even across cancer types and, uh, sorry, not across cancer types, but across tumors and across benign samples. And they're generally not uh, considered to be um, drivers of oncogenesis, although there's uh, one counterexample to that. And that counterexample is SLC45A3, uh, ALK4. This one was discovered in prostate cancer, and it's, uh, it's being associated with uh, cancer cell proliferation. So not all read-throughs are something that we, we should discount. Related to read-throughs, another thing we can look at to identify uh, true fusions is the distribution um, of which exons in the genes are fused. And we, we see that for the majority of read-throughs, uh, it's usually the second to last exon is fused to the, uh, of the upstream gene is fused to the second exon of the downstream gene. So that's a good sign that uh, perhaps this is not a functional gene fusion. It's just a, uh, it's just a missed transcription stop site. And yep. Can that also be a promoter? Yeah, I think a promoter. Yeah, a promoter exchange would be more likely to be uh, one of the first few exons is fused to uh, of the upstream gene. The five prime gene is fused to one of the first few exons of the downstream gene. So. Um, that would, I'm not sure if there's a picture of that in this particular slide, actually. I think that, so the point um, here is, with, with this graph, is that uh, read-throughs mostly looked like second to last to, to second. And then for the ones that are actually driven by, or created by inter and intrachromosomal translocations are uh, any distribution of exons to exons. So. Okay, reading frame uh, is, is also important for assessing function. So say we have uh, a fusion gene where the exons come together such that we break uh, the original wild type uh, transcripts exactly, exactly at a codon boundary uh, in both the five prime and three prime gene. So then in, in this obvious simple case, uh, we'll definitely preserve the reading frame and the subsequent uh, peptides after the fusion boundary will all be the same peptides that were produced if we had uh, a, a wild-type copy of this 3' gene. 
And correspondingly, we can also think of an example in which we don't break exactly at the codon boundary, but we break um, in the middle of two codons in such a way that we bring, bring these two fusion transcripts together and we uh, produce a nonsense codon at the fusion boundary, but the subsequent codons are, are exactly as they should be in the three prime original transcript. Uh, so the, in these two cases, we're pr preserving the reading frame of the three prime gene and preserving the function. And then of course, uh, for other cases, if there's uh, a slight mismatch in the, how the codons are broken, then we get nonsense after the fusion boundary in the three prime gene. Since the three prime gene is the one that's often associated with, uh, is often bringing the majority of the function to the fusion gene, then that's quite important. Okay, so we can also look at uh, the re associated rearrangements to tell us a little bit about the uh, fusions. For instance, this is an example that we found in a prostate cancer where we had what we thought were two independent uh, fusions, one involving Shank2 and one involving MYC. Uh, and then looking in the genome, we see that there's actually a complex rearrangement that's uh, simultaneously breaking uh, three different chromosomes in four different loci, rearranging them, and simultaneously producing these two fusion transcripts. So that tells us a little bit of how these fusions were formed. Another thing uh, we can look at is uh, what the structure is of, of a sim simpler breakpoint. Um, and we can find these examples where there's actually complex breakpoints where we have insertions of uh, disparate sequence at the breakpoint. So in this case, uh, it's not a simple breakpoint between SAMD12 and this gene uh, PHF20L1, because there's uh, one kilobytes of this other gene and one kilobytes of this uh, intergenic sequence that's inserted at the breakpoint. And this, so this is a good example of why we can't just rely on whole genome sequencing too, because we wouldn't discover uh, the connection between SAMD12 and the uh, PHF gene just from the genome sequencing. We uh, discover some independent breakpoints between all these other regions. Some considerations for experimental design. I think uh, larger cohorts is always going to give you uh, more power to detect these rarer fusions and often I think uh, fusions are going to be rare if we're, if we're being realistic because um, if they weren't rare people have been looking for a lot of them already and so um, it's unlikely we're going to find something that's 50, in 50% 50 of uh, ovarian cancer tum tumors because people have been looking enough already that it would have it would have shown up for sure. So I think uh, RNA seq and fusion discovery has a lot of promise in, in finding these more rare uh, fusion genes that can be targeted in a, a way that's sort of patient specific. And so for that we need lar larger cohort sizes, and then. Uh, because of that, we can use the fact that we are doing a larger cohort size to uh, filter based on the fact that we will, a lot of the artifacts that we see across, say, a cohort of 100 patients, if we see something that's in 75% of that, those patients, a lot of the times we can actually filter those because, uh, because the artifacts that come out of this, these um, RNA-seq experiments are going to be very prevalent across uh, a large number of patients. Okay, so uh, some encouraging uh, results from our recent study in which they've, so they discovered this ALK fusion in lung cancer, and now there's phase three clinical trials for the uh, crizinotib, which uh, is looking like it could successfully treat this disease. And finally, I think in the future, this field is gonna go towards trying to look for um, the actual protein products of these fusion transcripts. Uh, so what, um, in oncoproteogenomics, what people do currently is they take uh, mass spec data, shown uh, up here on the, the top left, and they have to combine this with a nucleotide database. 
to try and find these short peptide sequences that they can then uh, map back to the genome, and then they can use these peptide sequences to say which, which peptides are in their sample based on the max mass spec data. Um, and so this is, it's, it's a very indirect way of trying to understand the protein content of a sample, uh, because we have to know the nucleotide sequence that we're searching for. And so some future studies are, are very likely to, to leverage this, uh, this data by predicting from mRNA-seq uh, fusion transcripts, taking uh, those uh, fusion transcript sequences and then augmenting this uh, nucleotide database so that they can look in their sample for the associated uh, protein product. And so I'm sure that in the next few years there's going to be a couple papers on this. All right.